Um, so last but not least, um, in our trifecta of awesome uh, Ethereum uh, 2.0 researchers, um, I'd like to welcome to the stage to talk about the ETH2 custody game, uh, Justin Drake. Woo! Okay, thank you. Um, back. Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk about um, phase one of Ethereum 2.0, which is the, the data layer. And specifically, I'm going to talk about the data availability problem, which comes with uh, having lots of data. And even more specifically, I'm going to talk about uh, the, the custody game, which is one of the solutions to data availability. So three parts in the talk. Uh, what is the data avail availability problem? What are some of the solutions uh, that we in, intend to deploy in, in phase one and, and in the future? And then uh, a deep dive into the, the custody bit game, which was uh, recently uh, simplified. Okay, so what is the data availability, availability problem? So basically, um, you have uh, data, and you can reference that data with some sort of identifier, which is uh, succinct, like a 32-bit uh, byte hash. Um, and the question is, if you're only given the hash and, and, not, and you don't have the data, um, is, is the data available to you? Can you actually go ahead and, and download it? Um, and one very like, uh, simple approach, which is kind of the, the naive brute force approach, is that you just go ahead and try to download the data, and then you will know whether or not you can download the data. And that's perfectly fine. Uh, for Ethereum uh, 1.0 and for the beacon chain, because these are you know, very um, small chains and every validator, which we assume to be you know, a, a, a laptop on a, on a, on a home connection can, can download uh, without any problems. Uh, but this is unscalable, this kind of naive approach, especially in the context of sharding. So even though one single shard has totally reasonable bandwidth, you know, let's say on the order of one megabyte per minute, once you have a thousand shards, then it becomes a lot more data on the order of one gigabyte per minute. Um, and so, you know, how do how do we deal with all, all this data? And like the, the, the scalability solution of Ethereum 2.0 is that everyone doesn't download all the data, and it's just there's just too much data uh, for the validators to download. So what we do is that we take the shards and we kind of segment them into uh, into epochs, and then for each epoch we have um, so-called cross-link data, which is going to be the, the data in the shards plus the, the, the data in the headers. And this cross-link data, let's say, is 16 megabits, which is two megabytes. And the reason I'm, I'm talking in bits will be, uh, will be uh, relevant later. And um, what we have is that we have these references from the beacon chain um, to, to the shard data. So we have these so-called cross-links, which are the, 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 the yellow stars. Um, uh, and the, the, the hashes, which are the, 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 the purple um, rectangles, and they're pointing to data. And so, as a validator of the beacon chain, you only see these very succinct crosslinks, and you want to have high guarantees that the data that these crosslinks are pointing to are indeed available. Okay, so let's not look you know, too much as to what's in the data. We can forget its you know, uh, blocks and headers. Let's just uh, assume it's a blob of data. Um, and what are the steps to kind of uh, creating a, a cross-link in um, Ethereum 2.0? So the first step is to, to Merkleize. So we have this uh, hash tree root. So instead of taking a, a simple hash, we, we Merkleize. So that, just a, a detail. We have this identifier, which is a data root. And then um, the, the attesters. Uh, which are basically validators in a committee assigned to this very specific crosslink data are meant to um, download the data and uh, and sign it if they are able to sign it. So they're kind of vouching that the data is available, is downloadable. And then the various attestations are aggregated uh, across the committee using BLS aggregation. And then once you reach a certain threshold, which is enshrined in the protocol, then you, be, you get the, the, the yellow star and you are a crosslink. And uh, these crosslinks go in the beacon chain. And so you know, to rephrase the data availability problem, how do we know that um, you know, from the crosslink you can recover the data if you're not a validator that you know, 
was assigned to this specific crosslink. And um, the reason that uh, you really want to know that the data is available is that if, for some reason or another, this data is not available, then that means that you can't download it, the, the network in general can't download it, then you have a so-called unavailable crosslink. And this is like super toxic waste uh, that will pollute the beacon chain extremely fast. And so um, if, if this happens, uh, then you know, emergency uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, mechanisms need to come in place. We need to do manual rollback uh, all the way back to when, when there wasn't this uh, unavailable uh, crosslink. So this is one of the, the, the main problems of, uh, of phase one. And um, we're going to see how, how we can solve the, this problem. So in phase one, uh, we're going to have three uh, solutions uh, to, to, th to the data availability problem. So one is going to involve cross-linking, uh, which is a process that just uh, walks through, but I will give more details as to why it works. Um, and then uh, we're going to go through custody proofs, uh, which is like the, the, the main content of this talk. And then there's also a mechanism, which is the, the, the chunk challenges. And you can kind of think of them as kind of a, on a time axis where the custody proofs are proofs that you have the data and you can only build them when you have the data. So they kind of before even committing to having the data. So they're kind of in the past relative to crosslink. Crosslink is like a real time thing. You know, you're, you're, you're committing to having seen the having seen the data in real time. And then the chunk challenges is basically a thing that happens post facto, which is, oh, you know, you, you committed to this data, um, please give me this, this random chunk in, in, in of the data um, that happens uh, post facto. Um, so, and then in phase three uh, plus, uh, or maybe in Ethereum 3.0, I we don't really know, or maybe even in, in phase two, if, uh, if, uh, if we're very aggressive, um, we have something more fancy, which we call um, availability proofs. And these use kind of uh, fancy math and tricks like uh, erasure codes and stocks. Um, and I, I won't go into details. Uh, that's, I guess, for another talk. OK, so um, let's see why crosslinks uh, work. So the reason crosslinks uh, works under a certain secur security model that we have um, in Ethereum uh, 2.0 uh, namely that um, you know, an honest majority assumption is because we have this, th th this pool, a very large pool, let's say a million validators, and we're assuming that two thirds are honest. So they will follow the protocol rules, which includes downloading the data. So two thirds are honest, two thirds are angels, and then uh, one third are demons. And when you have a, uh, a, a pretty good uh, random number generator, such as Randall, then um, and you have a, a crosslink committee, which is around uh, a, a thousand uh, validators, then with extremely high probability, at least one half of the validator is honest. So you, lo you lose a little bit of honesty going from the pool to the committee, but it's not too bad. And then, um, because you have this threshold in the crosslink, you can make the threshold large enough, and so in this case, you make it uh, greater than one half, and then you have a, a, a guarantee with a very uh, high probability that at least one, if you do reach the threshold, at least one of the voters will be honest. And so being honest means that you you've actually have downloaded the data, it's on your computer, and if someone requests it from you, you'll, you'll, you'll share it with them. So the data is available to the whole network. Okay, but there is one problem with uh, crosslinks. And it's, it's due to this kind of uh, misalignment of incentives. So there's two ways to go about uh, crosslinks. So the, the honest way is basically you have this uh, chunk of data, which is quite large, and you need to go ahead and download it. And only after downloading it, you, uh, you sign your attestation. And then because you, you, you did all this work, we will reward you in the protocol. Um, and this is kind of uh, uh, the... <clears throat> The approach where you need to do all this work, and you know you have this man that's uh, sweating. Um, but then there's the other approach, which is kind of cheating, which is um, you have other people that are making votes, these attestations, and you just kind of look at what other what other people are doing, and you kind of uh, copy what you're doing. So it's kind of a copycat strategy. 
And um, seeing what other people are voting on is very cheap because these votes are very succinct. And so you can just follow the crowd and uh, still get the rewards. And this is basically the, um, the light node approach, which is the, the lazy approach. And it, it's kind of um, <clears throat> like uh, SPV mining in, in Bitcoin. And it's, it's kind of bad because if you have a, an attacker, which is not necessarily um, that huge, but like significant, they can, um, they can vote for uh, an unavailable uh, crosslink, and then all the lazy people will pile on, and then you'll reach the threshold, and then you have an unavailable crosslink. So that's, that's kind of bad. Um, so one of the, the, the key idea is that in addition to signing the data, you're gonna tag on this proof of custody, which is this kind of really cool construction, which is just, you're gonna tag on just one single bit, either zero or one, uh, in your attestation, and that is going to prevent um, or disincentivize people to be lazy. Because if people are lazy and they don't download the data, then uh, with probability one half, they're going to mess up um, <clears throat> the proof of custody, and so uh, they're going to get slashed. So, as a now, now as a validator, if you want to be lazy, what are you gaining? You're just gaining a little bit of bandwidth. It's a very uh, minimal gain, but what do you stand to lose? You stand to lose your, your deposit with, um, with, with high probability. And what we've done basically here is that we've upgraded the security assumption um, of crosslinks, which um, was honest majority, to something closer to um, a rational majority. So there's, there's kind of this, there's the, the honest uh, people and then there's the rational, are they kind of at two extremes. Um, and there's, there's all sorts of things that go in between honesty and rationality. So one, one of the <clears throat> things in the gap is going to be laziness, and that's specifically what we're targeting. I mean, there's other things that can happen, like collusion and bribing, which we're not addressing here. Uh, but laziness is, is uh, what we are addressing. Okay, and same thing here. Um, with extremely high probability, you're going to have at least uh, one honest, honest but lazy um, <clears throat> a validator, and they're gonna actually do the work because of the proof of custody. <clears throat> okay, um, chunk challenges. These are um, you know very easy. So um, let's assume that you've uh, you've signed an attestation, so you've uh, committed to the fact that you've downloaded some data, and you know the data. Um, someone might want to make a query about the data, and they say, "Just give me this chunk at random." And um, the, the response needs to be fed on, on the beacon chain. So everyone is, a, is, uh, <clears throat> is aware of the beacon chain and the beacon chain itself is available through this uh, brute force approach of everyone that just downloading it. And the reason why we have a small chunk as opposed to the whole data is because the beacon chain has very limited bandwidth and so we can only afford to put these small chunks. And then this, in addition to the um, small chunk, you also have a, a, a Merkle proof that the chunk does indeed match um, the, the crosslink and the, the, the index, basically the, the location in the data um, that has been, um, that was in the challenge. Okay, so um, now to the, 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 the most interesting bit, which is the, the custody bit game. So how do we basically enhance these attestations by adding one single bit in such a way that if you don't download the data, you will, you will be caught uh, half of the time. So just to uh, reframe the, the, the problem again, slightly more abstractly, so you have the data, you have these, uh, the, the data root, the signature, both form an attestation, and you wanna basically um, have a so-called custody bit, which is a, basically a, a crypto economic um, construction. So it's not a, a cryptographic thing. It's not like you know cryptographically with very high probability that that person has downloaded the data. You you basically weaken that a little bit and say that <clears throat> with probability one half, if they got it wrong, uh, sorry, with probability one half, they will only get it right. Uh, they will only get it, the custody bit right with probability one half, and they'll get it wrong with probability one half. And we will know about this at some point in the future. In the, in the near future. Okay, so just a, a quick note about why uh, one, one, one single bit is kind of a, a very nice property to have. 
And the reason is re related to aggregation. So BLS aggregation um, is uh, a signature aggregation techniques, technique which works extremely well when you're aggregating the same uh, the same message. So the, the verification cost technically is like going to be um, like one pairing per, per, per message. It doesn't matter how many people are signing it, you still have this, 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 this basic cost. But as soon as you have multiple, multiple messages being signed, you need to pay these multiple pairings. And when you only have two types of messages, you know, attestation plus the bit one, attestation plus the bit two, then you can just aggregate them separately and your verification cost only doubled and it's, 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 still, it's still marginal. So basically in the, in the optimistic case, where people get the proof of uh, the, cu the custody bit correct, then there's, there's, there's very little overhead to the beacon chain. Um, and if people are, you know, are doing very stupid things, like not downloading the data, but still participating in the attestations, then they'll get caught and there'll be a challenge game to basically slash them. Okay, so what is kind of the, one of the, the, the key ideas in the construction? So, you have the data and you want to come up with a construction which kind of proves that you and only you have, like, you definitely have the data. So one of the, the ideas is that you introduce the notion of a key which is unique to you as a validator. So even though the, the data is generic to everyone, you have a, a key that is unique to you. And we're going to temporarily attach value to this key. So if you give the key to someone else, to some sort of outsourcing service, um, then that outsourcing service can, can use the key and, and, and take your money. So if you don't trust the outsourcing service, you really don't want to give them the, your, your, your key. Okay, so we have the data, we have this uh, private key, and what we do is that we, we mix the data and the key really, really thoroughly so that you know, they kind of <coughs> maximally combined. Um, and then once we have this, this mix, which for example could be the XOR, so if you have the very long piece of data and the short key, you just XOR every single chunk in the data, that's one way of mixing. And then once you have this mix, you're gonna extract one single random bit. So um, that's going to be using a so-called pseudo random function, the PRF. And one way, for example, to extract the random bit is to, to take the hash of the mix and take the first bit of the hash. Okay, that's going to be random. Um, <clears throat> and the, the whole point of this construction is that the only way to compute this custody bit is to have both the data and the key, and in particular, to have the data. So you have downloaded the data. Um, and just to, to rephrase this non-outsourceability non uh, visually, you have the validator, they have the key, but they kind of want to be lazy, they want to outsource the downloading of the data to, to someone else. So someone else has the data. And unfortunately, in order to compute the, the, the custody bit, you need to combine the key and the data. So there's kind of two ways to combine from this, from this uh, setup. Way number one is to take the data and bring it to the left side. Um, well, that's kind of defeats the purpose because now the validator actually has to download the data. Um, so they've, they've gained nothing from the outsourcing service. And the other option is to send the key to the right side, but that's not gonna work for the validator because then the outsourcing service has the key and so they can steal, um, they can steal the money up from the, the validator. Okay, so let's go through like the, the, the whole uh, dance in the scheme. Uh, in the protocol, so we have three phases, commit, reveal, and then challenge. So commit, you commit to having the data, then you're going to reveal your key, and then if the custody bit is wrong, you're gonna be uh, slashed. So off-chain, in the commit phase, you will generate your key, which is gonna be unique and deterministic, you download the data, you compute the bit, and then you commit, boom, that goes on-chain. Some time later, you will reveal your key. And then once you reveal the key, basically your custody bit becomes publicly verifiable. Anyone, anywhere in the world who has the data now, now also has the key. And so they can verify off-chain, you know, does the, does the mix, does the combination of the key and the data match the custody bit that was in the initial commitment in the attestation? And if for some reason it does not match, then 
a new challenge. You, you go on chain with the data and you say, hey, um, beacon chain, please you know, compute this, this custody bit. It's wrong. And, uh, and please slash, uh, slash the validator. And in addition to this uh, slashing condition, we have another slashing condition, which I kind of been talking about explicitly, which is that if for some reason the, the key has been given to someone else, then you want to have this, um, this slashing condition for leaking the key early before, you met, before the, the reveal phase. Okay. Now, there is one problem with this, uh, this scheme here, and is that in the worst case, if uh, validators have a, a bad um, custody bit, then the, in the challenge, the, the data is going to be is going to be like the whole crosslink data. It's going to be all 16 megabits. So that's too much data uh, for the beacon chain. The, the beacon chain can only handle things like the, on the order of so-called chunks, which um, you know are, are about five, four, four, four uh, kilobits, 4,000 bits. So how do we go from this very large piece of data, 16 megabits, to four just four um, uh, kilobits? And the trick. Um, is to basically take the data and cut it into 4,000 chunks, each chunk of size 4,000 bits. Um, and then for each chunk, you compute a separate custody bit. And then you kind of combine these bits, the so-called chunk bits, you have 4,000 of those, into a final custody bit. So if you just ignore the middle bit, you still have a um, custodial PRF, so you ha still have a scheme which takes the data and produces one bit and <clears throat> guarantees that you have the data. Um, but there's this now, there's this kind of intermediate uh, thing in the middle. And this intermediate thing allows you to challenge very efficiently. So if for some reason you disagree on the custody bit, then you will <clears throat> publish on chain your version as a challenger of the of the of the intermediate bits, and then the original validator, the, it's their duty to either, uh, well, to, to point out where the challenger is wrong, so that they can come to agreement as to who who is wrong, and if and if for some reason the challenger is, is not wrong, then it will be impossible for the for the original validator to uh, point out an error in the challenger, <clears throat> and. Uh, one kind of important detail here is basically the, the numbers that we've chosen. So notice that 4,000 is the square root of 16 million. And so um, it turns out that taking the square root is, is, is most efficient uh, because the, yeah, you, you're going to have the, the, the number of chunks times the size of the chunk is going to be the, the size of the original file. And the challenge is going to be the sum of these two things. And so taking the square root is optimal. Anyway. It's a detail. Um, but yeah, just to rephrase visually the, how the challenge game works, uh, the only difference is now in the, in the final step in the challenge, you provide these intermediate chunk bits, and then the, the validator, the original validator, has to point out uh, where the, the challenger is wrong, uh, if it is wrong. And uh, the way they do that is that they, they, they provide the data. Um, to the beacon chain with the data and the key, the beacon chain can compute this intermediate bit. And of course, uh, the, the, the data is authenticated against the, 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 the crosslink. Okay, so this is one of, one of my last slides. So um, th this, whole this whole scheme is like pretty, pretty amazing. It's very cool that it exists. Um, but one of the, <clears throat> one of the uh, design considerations for Ethereum 2.0 is to be so-called MPC friendly or friendly to, 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 to staking pools and things like that. So we, we want to be able to take the notion of a validator, which is kind of a logically a, a single entity, and behind the scenes, kind of off-chain, off we want to allow uh, users to, to take this validator and split it up into shares and have some, you know, um, M of N logic. Um, so there's, there's two use cases for that. One is staking pools. So if you, if you don't have the minimum uh, amount of ether required, for example, uh, 32 ETH or 64 ETH, um, we don't know yet for sure, um, you can pool your funds with other people 
and you each have kind of voting power in proportion to, to, to your, your stake. And then you can set a reasonable threshold um, within your staking pool um, and, uh, and, and basically have one single validator with multiple users behind it. The other use case for being MPC friendly um, is the idea of distributed staking. So you, you, you are a single validator, you have the 32 ETH, but you don't want to put all your eggs in a single machine. So what if this machine gets hacked? Or what if this machine goes offline? Um, so what you can do is you can, for example, have um, three uh, different machines, and you can set up um, two out of three um, um, <clears throat> validations so that if you, if you have two of the machines that are online, then the system keeps on running. And if you have only one, at most one machine that gets hacked, then um, your, 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 your hot key, which is your, your, your hot validation key, uh, can't get hacked. Okay, and in, in order to kind of be MPC friendly, we need every single part of all of Ethereum 2.0 to be MPC friendly. And there's, um, there's going to be three um, different things that are specific to the, um, <clears throat> to the custody bit scheme, uh, which makes it tricky, but um, turns out there's these really nice constructions uh, that, that, uh, that involve, on the one hand, BLS signatures. So it's, <clears throat> you know, BLS is very good for these uh, threshold signatures, and you can use threshold signatures as your, your, your key scheme, your secret. And we do the same thing for, for Randall. So, <clears throat> you know, Randall is a commit reveal scheme where you, com you, you, you commit to something and then you reveal your entropy. Um, one way to phrase this, one way to implement it, is you commit with your BLS pub key, and then the way you reveal is by signing uh, a, a message. And because BLS signatures are, are unique and deterministic, um, you have a well defined reveal. Anyway. Um, and the, the, the other cool construction is for the PRF. So it, it turns out there's this, this wonderful like mathematical construction called the uh, Legend symbol, and it seems to fit you know, exactly our, our needs. So it, it can take uh, a chunk of bits, and it will generate a, a, a unique um, <clears throat> random bit um, out of it. And it's, the whole thing is like very MPC friendly. And I think it's a, maybe two or three rounds of communication, uh, <clears throat> which is great. Anyway, um, thank you. This uh, was uh, uh, the whole scheme. Um, if you want to read the specs, I encourage you. There's a, there's a draft right now, but it's, uh, it's pretty good. Um, and yeah, I also want to thank uh, people who've been working uh, on, on the spec. And that's it. Thank you.